Hello and welcome to Murder in the UK. Today we're looking at the case of Sabah Khan. Sabah, along with her sister Salma and the family, had moved from Holland and settled in Luton, Bedfordshire. Salma was subject to an arranged marriage with a gentleman from Pakistan called Hafiz. Sabah started an affair with Habiz and at one stage even had to have an abortion to keep it quiet from her sister Salma. Saba was often left as the babysitter for Salma and Hafiz's children. In May 2016, she'd had enough of her sister and wanted Hafiz all to herself. She viciously attacked her sister. At trial in 2017, she pleaded guilty and was sentenced to serve a minimum 22 years in prison. What are your thoughts on this case? Please comment in the section below. If you want more information, visit www.murderuk.com or stay tuned for a video documentary about this case. Thank you. Twenty-six-year-old Saima Khan and her eighteen-year-old sister, Saba, moved from Holland to this street with their parents and two brothers. Saima Khan's family seemed the very image of a, of a respectable family that lived in the suburbs. Um, they all had jobs. Both Saima and her sister worked as carers, and they all seemed to be upstanding members of the community. It's just the normal run-of-the-mill street. I would say, you know, people live how they live. It's a very suburban area, very family oriented. So certainly there's never been any major crime that I know of. The two sisters soon settled into their new life. The two were inseparable. In fact, Saba described the way in which they interacted with each other as being so close that she felt it was one soul divided into two bodies. You could tell they were close, obviously, because they were, wherever they would go, they'd go together anyway. Saima Khan marries Hafiz, and he moves into the happy family home in Luton. Saima and Hafiz go on to have four children. For the inseparable sisters, this was a challenging change in the family dynamic. tale of two sisters, one of whom was married and had children and had the perfect family life. And the other was the younger sister who lived more or less in her shadow. But in 2016, everything for this family was to change. It was otherwise an ordinary day in the life of that family. Uh, Saima was due to go out and work as a carer, which was her part-time job. Uh, Saba, as always, would be looking after her nephews and nieces back in the house. Just before 11 o'clock, uh, Saba sent four text messages to Saima Khan, telling her that uh, one of the children was crying um, and she should come home as soon as possible. Saima responds to her sister's call and returns home to her children. Her car pulls into their driveway at 11.07 p.m. A neighbor's CCTV camera picks up the moment she enters the house. But as Saima Khan enters her home, the unthinkable happens. She is attacked in her hallway, stabbed and left to die. A woman was killed at a house in Overstone Road on Monday night. She's been named locally as 34-year-old Simon Khan, a mother of four young children. The killing uh, was ferocious. Uh, it was awful. There were 68 strikes with a knife. Some of the injuries were so severe that Simon nearly lost a hand and her head was nearly cut off. I was watching telly and you heard all this screaming, but the sound of the screaming 
was like blood curdling sort of thing, you know. That's the sound that I got in my head. I knew that something awful had happened. When police arrive at the scene, they are met by Simon's sister, Saba, who tragically came across her sister's body. They were met with a scene of complete carnage. This was an ordinary, humble family home in which, in the hallway, was lying the body of a woman. There was blood everywhere. So much blood that it was almost like a river. The police body cameras record everything Saba says following her discovery of her sister in the hallway. <laughs> so who was at home with her, do you know? I was at home. So it was just I you came two? Home. Yeah, I, mean, okay. I came home. She... But then I heard her shouting suddenly, and when I heard her shouting, I just came out. When I came out, she... it was just her shouting. Did you didn't hear anybody else? I didn't hear anybody okay. else. But I heard banging. When I heard banging, when I came down, I saw How her How long like ago that. was that, roughly? Maybe about half an hour ago. Half an hour ago, OK. And when I came down, then I rang my dad. I didn't know what to do. Okay. First, I was actually there. I just brought her to me. Did you hear knock on the door or anything like that? No, I don't think so. Were you aware of anyone else in the house? I don't think so, no. no. Okay. Apart from when she came in, I didn't hear anything else before okay. that. Okay. And then when she came... So, so your, your belief is that it was just yourself, her and the children? Me, her and... Where were the children? That's it. They're, they're, still, they're still, still inside, yeah. yeah. Firstly, I just hugged her. I just... I thought I, like... When I saw the wounds, I, like... I thought I'm going to put pressure to her. So she... Was the front door open? No, it was closed. It was closed. Front door was closed. So the yeah. back door smashed? The back door, yeah. How's that happened? Do you know? I don't know because no, I don't know because when I came down, I literally saw her there with glass lying about around her. Saba Khan told police that she'd been upstairs in the shower, heard a bang, come downstairs, and found her sister in the hallway, um, very badly injured. She assumed that uh, there was had been an intruder, um, and it was a burglary gone wrong. Rumours of a burglary escalate through the community. On this side of the house, there's also a uh, side door with quite a lot of the glass missing, uh, leading people to speculate that that might have been how a suspected burglar may have gained access to the house. We did feel very scared. So I used to double lock the door anyway, thinking uh, any time anybody could come in. And yeah, I was afraid to be home alone anyway. There was a great deal of fear among people uh, locally because as the story was at the time this was uh, a lady who'd returned home to her house uh, to see her children and uh, had succumbed to a fairly horrific death a community shaken to the core by a brutal murder as police scramble to make sense of the immediate facts where is the killer what are they doing in these vital moments, having just killed Saima so savagely? Have they fled the scene? Or are they closer than you think? <laughs> 34-year-old mother of four, Saima Khan from Luton, has been stabbed on her doorstep. Inside the house is her beloved sister, Saba. As police arrive on the scene, she reveals that she has come downstairs to discover her sister dying. I shout from the bathroom, I go to, are you home? She goes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I was fine. But then I heard her shouting suddenly, and when I heard her shouting, I just came out. When I came out, she was just her shouting. Did not hear anybody else? I didn't hear anybody okay. else. But I heard banging. When I heard banging, when I came down, I saw her like the murder investigation is continuing in Luton after a woman was killed. Neighbours say she was the victim of a botched burglary. There's also, on this side of the house, a uh, side door with quite a lot of the glass missing, uh, leading people to speculate that that might have been how a suspected burglar may have gained access to the house. Faced with a broken window pane and a seemingly surprise attack carried out to such a ferocious extent, is this a burglary gone wrong? or something more sinister. After such a brutal crime, the question police need to answer is what does a killer do next? This is where police use expert criminologists to get into the mind of a killer and determine their next move. 
My name is Dr Jane Monkton-Smith and I'm a forensic criminologist. In the very early stages of, of any investigation, we can look at patterns and behaviours of killers to try and find out what the motivation is. Overston Road in Luton is now a crime scene and the family are moved to a property nearby so a thorough forensic search of the family home can begin. So I got a phone call from the news desk just telling me that there had been a death as a result uh, of what we thought was a bungled robbery at the time. This was a road I'd driven past so many times, but when I got here on that day, it was totally transformed. There were police cars everywhere stretching up the road. The police cordon started probably a few yards up the road. For the police, time is now of the essence. The first 60 minutes of investigation, and indeed the first 24 hours, is the golden hours for us because we know the suspect will likely go home, change clothes, wash and shave and shower, and then we've lost some of the forensic evidence. First point of call is to seal the place off, cordon it. Only people go in there wearing protective clothes and protective shoes and gloves and they will have an examination looking first for any murder weapon. With forensic teams carrying out a fingertip search of the house, others comb the neighbourhood. It was just eerie, you know, there was a very still quietness about the road. Police knocked at the door and asked us if we'd seen anything or anybody down the garden or had you heard anything. Then everything was cordoned off as well. From then onwards, they started the investigation, I think. That's the frenzy team, like you said, every day throughout the whole week, basically, you know, doing the investigations in the garden, on the road, everywhere they were doing. Two days later, and the police have no murder weapon, no motive, and no suspect. What they do have is a body. And the post-mortem results provide crucial evidence. Post-mortem is critical because it will prove that you have a murder. It should be able to tell you the size of the knife from the wounds by measuring it. So when you come out of the post-mortem, you know you've definitely got a murder. You know she definitely died by however many knife wounds there were. It gives a profile. That kind of violence, that comes from an almost unearthly rage. Rumours start to spread that this is not all as it seems. It's difficult to understand why a burglar would see someone like Say McCann as such a threat that she had to be murdered, and not just murdered, stabbed repeatedly with such ferocity that her neck was practically severed unless he was a raving lunatic. It's hard to imagine how an intruder or why an intruder would have carried out that particular kind of attack. Suddenly the police have a new focus. This is not necessarily a burglary gone wrong. The post-mortem results point towards frenzied violence, more characteristic of a crime of passion. Murders in botched burglaries are incredibly rare and there is no reason in that scenario for somebody to be incredibly angry. There was a change in the air, there was a, a change of feeling in the community. The kind of injuries which we were hearing that Simon had experienced were not the kind of injuries you would expect in those circumstances. As the person who discovered the body, Police need to interview Sister Saba, as her account could hold the key to the case. Saba's police interview is consistent with her story of a possible intruder. She told the police she was in the shower when her sister returned home. She heard a bang, I think, and she came downstairs and she found her in the hallway in a pool of blood. And she assumed that it had been a burglar or an intruder or some, something like that, because there'd 
back door had been smashed in. The police would have wanted to know everything about Saima's private life. And of course, Saba would have been a person who could give that kind of information. Saba also offers police some vital information about Sister Saima's personal life, that her sister was having an affair. During an interview with the police, Saba said that she had overheard a conversation between her sister and her sister's lover, where he had threatened her. So the police would have looked at the husband because that would have been the more obvious suspect. And if uh, Sama Khan had been having an affair, like her sister said, it would have certainly given him a reason to have killed her. In this kind of situation, the most likely person to have murdered Saima would be her husband. That's just a statistical likelihood. So they would definitely have been looking at him. Police trawl through the family computers looking for clues. And what they soon discover turns the investigation on its head. It wasn't Saima having an affair. It was Hafiz. Police hone in on Hafiz's internet activities. In any investigation, anybody who you think is a potential suspect, then you will start looking at their use of IT, telephones, computers, laptops, iPads. In this day and age, everyone leaves a digital footprint. The examination of the family computers is a game changer. Someone wanted Saima Khan dead. On the internet searches, they found how you could kill somebody, how you could poison them, how you could overdose of drugs. When forensic investigators delve deeper, they discover something else. It isn't Hafiz who has been making these searches. It's Saba. She started internet searches looking at ways of poisoning someone, uh, ways of killing someone. She hired somebody in Pakistan who was one of these priests who dealt in the black arts and asked him to cast a spell on her sister Saima to see if that would get rid of her. We know that she had engaged the services of a mysterious character called the Fixer in Pakistan. She had paid him 5,000 pounds and asked him to kill her sister. In fact, Saba Khan's internet records reveal that for months, she's been searching ways to kill someone and not get caught. Saba Khan, she'd done Google searches for ways of killing people, uh, poisons, poisonous snakes, um, drugs, uh, all sorts of different ways, and how to commit a perfect murder and get away with it. Saba has been planning her sister's murder, or at least contemplating the possibility of murdering a sister for a period of time, demonstrates the premeditation involved. This isn't a crime of passion. It's not an in-the-moment scenario. This is somebody who has orchestrated the downfall of another human being. Her own sister, somebody that she's grown up with, lived with, loved. She's been living with her whilst planning her death. It's 11 o'clock, I'm Simon Oxley. The headline... As the police focus shifts onto the victim's sister, in Overston Road, scene of crime officers make a crucial discovery. In Saba's bedroom. They found the bag, which had some blood-stained clothing, and they found a murder weapon with blood on it. The evidence was sitting in that bag. There was the knife, there were the bloody clothes. The murder weapon and clothes are swiftly sent for forensic tests. The results, damning. The police also found a black hoodie inside the bag in Saba Khan's bedroom, and they analysed it and found there were flecks of glass on the hoodie, which showed that she'd been near the door when it had been broken, supposedly by the burglars, but actually by Saba Khan herself.
Sabah Khan from Newark Road in Luton was arrested by Bedfordshire Police on Tuesday. The 26-year-old is accused of murdering her sister at a house in Overston Road. The murder weapon showed traces of Simon's DNA. Well, they're thinking we've cracked the case now, we've, we've solved it. Sabah Khan from Luton was arrested by Bedfordshire Police on Tuesday. The 26-year-old is accused of murdering her sister. Sabah Khan has been arrested for the murder of her sister, Saima. The killer had been in front of police all along. But what turns a loving daughter, a devoted sister, into a cold-blooded killer? And how had Sabah Khan got away with her crime for eight days? After the murder, Saba may have felt some relief that she'd actually done what she had planned to do. And there may have been a period where she was thinking a little bit more clearly, but focused on diverting the police investigation. Journalist Emily Penning was hot on the story. She was staging a burglary. Afterwards, she hid the blood-stained knife and the clothes that she would been wearing, including the black hoodie, um, and she smashed the back door and she upturned a box of jewellery as well. So she'd really considered it very carefully and she carried it out with cold and calculating precision to make it look like a burglary. She's created a scene. Now Saba needs to get rid of the evidence and takes a shower. I cannot think that you could stab someone over 60 times and not get covered in blood. Having set the scene of a burglary gone wrong, Saba's plan is in place. But for it to work, she needs to notify people of her supposed discovery. But it's not the police she calls, it's her father. Calling her parents first, um, made sense from her point of view because she didn't want the police to arrive too quickly, but she needed to call someone to show that she had reacted to the situation which had uh, faced her, which was her sister lying in the hallway with multiple stab wounds. One of the reasons she'd have called her father was because she wanted to cover her track. She wanted to give herself an alibi. He's the most obvious person she'd call. Remember, she's from a strict Muslim background. He would know what to do. So part of it is she's playing on that. Secondly, it gives her a chance to practice the story. Does this sound plausible? And most importantly, it kind of gives her some breathing space. Saba's family rushed to the scene within minutes, closely followed by an ambulance and the police. She probably thinks that there's every chance she's going to get away with it, especially if she can manipulate the investigation. Crucially, police body cameras record the aftermath. Let's look again at Saba's performance. This is a killer caught on camera. <laughs> so who was at home with her, do you know? I was at home. So it was just you I shout from the bathroom, I go to, are you home? She goes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I was fine. But then I heard her shouting suddenly, and when I heard her shouting, I just came out. When I came out, she was just her shouting. Did you hear anybody else? I didn't hear anybody else. Okay. I heard banging. When I heard banging, when I came down, I saw her. She'd rehearsed her story time and time again in the planning of this murder. And she was determined, you know, when the police turned up, she was going to get that story out. She was going to divert the investigation. And she may have appeared on the surface to be quite agitated, but I don't think she was. I think she was just determined to get her story out and to get the chronology out. But she didn't seem unduly upset. She wasn't crying and she certainly wasn't what you might call hysterical some of the things you might expect to see when you've just found your sister brutally murdered well, did you hear anyone I... knock on the door or anything like that no i don't think so are you aware of anyone else in the house 
I don't think so no. at all. Okay. Apart from when she came in, I didn't hear anything else before okay. that. Okay. And then when she came. So, so she your your belief is that it was just yourself, her, and the children. Me, her, and where were the children? That's it. They're still inside. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The girls, were, the girls were awake. When you look at Saba through the body cam talking to the police moments after her sister's been found mutilated and murdered, she shows something entirely distinct to what we'd expect. Firstly, she lists all the things that happened in chronology. It's almost like she's articulated the story and she's ready to tell it. Secondly, she's incredibly compliant. So she's behaving for the police officers. She feels it's important to make sure that she seems completely honest. As Saba warms to her role, she even claims she tried to stem blood flowing from Saima's wounds. Yeah, I took a scarf to cover it because I thought I was gonna, yeah. you know, you know when you cover the wound and like stop from bleeding. Saba's confidence in her performance is building. Even when police point to a cut to her own hand. This is someone who has planned their response to the ultimate degree. She had glass, so I took the oh, glass okay. out, and it was glass everywhere, so I was just okay. hugging it to me, and then I don't know. Sabah's cut herself with the glass when she smashed the window. The way that she tries to cover that up when the police ask her why she's got a wound is to suggest that she was trying to help her sister. She got cut during trying to cover up her wound. Now, that again puts her in the position of hero. How could she possibly have caused any harm to her sister? She was merely trying to protect her. Two days after the murder, and this is where Saba is called to the police station to make that all-important witness statement as the first person on the scene. So the police were dealing with Saba as potentially a crucial witness to the murder, and they treated her as such. Uh, she gave all the outward signs of someone who was deeply and genuinely distraught. She was a grieving sibling. She's the one who chanced upon her sister's body, and everything about her demeanor suggested to the police that she was someone who was deeply upset. After the murder, she may have felt some relief that she'd actually done what she had planned to do. And there may have been a period where she was thinking a little bit more clearly, but focused on diverting the police investigation. But as that relief kind of wanes away, the worry about what she's actually done and can she get away with it will start to come in. So she will be very nervous at this point. It's during this witness interview Saba steers the investigation even further from herself by introducing a new focus. She tried to sully the name of her sister by implying that her sister might have been having a secret affair that no one else knew about, introducing a possible mystery suspect who may have had a motive to kill her. Now, this is clever in two ways. Firstly, she's trying to distract the police. She's trying to give another motive for the death of her sister. But she's also, and this is the insidious part of that lie, She's also trying to discredit her sister in the relationship she had with her husband. She's trying to make her the guilty party. And that's destroying the image of her sister, full stop. Police believe Saba's account, and she returns to the fold of her grieving family. It's two o'clock, I'm Lee Agnew. Saima's husband, Hafiz, says the brutal murder has deprived his children of their mother and instead of being able to spend time as a family, they've been left with a gap in their lives and their hearts torn apart. Three days after Saima's murder, shockwaves were still reverberating around the community and Saba's movements were not going unnoticed. Well, she just went to work, you know. I mean, it was, she was booked to go to work, so she just went to work as a normal. And they tried to get on with their lives as best as they could. Sabah Khan, we know, went back to work, and it's difficult to imagine what her mindset must have been at that time. She'd 
pulled off a huge stunt. She not only had she committed this crime, but she'd concocted a tale about a burglary, which was readily believed by the community and seemed to be the answer to all of her problems. The police would have been watching Saba's behavior. There are things that she may have done that may have made the police think, well, we need to look closely there. After her sister's murder, Saba's actions, as far as she's concerned, have almost let her get away with it. She's played a part, helped police with their inquiries, and supported her grieving family and Saima's husband, Hafiz. But now the police investigation is catching up with her. There was, of course, a, a, a shift during the investigation where Saba, who'd been the, the prime witness in this case, suddenly became a suspect. They are about to discover a vital piece of evidence which takes the case in a whole new twisted direction. You know, I mean, nobody knows what happens in, you know, in houses. You have perfect families, they look perfect. You know, nobody knows, but when you find out that somebody so close to you is capable of that level of violence is shocking. Having discovered Saba had been researching the internet for ways to kill her sister, police have now uncovered something else. CCTV footage of Saba buying the knife. Police were able to obtain CCTV footage of Saba queuing up at a supermarket, actually buying that knife, which she would later use to kill her sister. It's irrefutable evidence. But why would Saba Khan want her sister dead? I think Saba Khan wanted all the things that her sister had. She wanted a husband, she wanted her children, and if she couldn't have her own children, she wanted same as children. It's deeply disturbing to think that within the middle of the community, a supposedly happy family had this time bomb ticking, waiting to go off. It was such a shocking and wholly unprecedented crime. With Sabah Khan in custody, police seize her mobile phone. And what they find is explosive. In Luton, with Saba Khan in custody, charged with the murder of her sister, Saima, police are piercing together evidence trying to find a motive. And a search of Saba's mobile phone reveals information which turns the case on its head. It isn't Saima with the secret lover. It's Saba. But who is the affair with? Suddenly, the motive becomes clear. Police discovered that uh... Sabo had been having an affair with Saima's husband for up to four years. They would be sleeping together under the same roof in which they lived with the extended family. Sabo was by that stage 26 years of age, coming from a cultural background in which it would be expected that by her mid-twenties she'd be married, as indeed her sister Saima was, that she'd have started her own family. She didn't have that. As jealousy developed from Saba towards Saima Khan, who had the husband, she had the children, she had a certain status and seniority within the family. A mother found dead, her younger sister arrested and charged, the discovery of an illicit affair. But how had this culminated in murder? The impression I got of Saba was that in many respects she'd been a loner. She'd become detached from the world outside. I didn't get the sense that she had a social circle, friends and associates. It seemed like she kept herself to herself 
and her world really revolved around her connection with her sister and with her parents. In fact, Saba's life not only revolved around that of her sisters, but became intrinsically entwined with it when, in 2012, Saba and her brother-in-law, Hafiz, embarked on an affair. It was an illicit relationship. I mean, bearing in mind we're talking about a traditional Pakistani family in which this sort of behavior was completely unacceptable. It's unacceptable in most families, you'd imagine, that a brother-in-law would be sleeping with his sister-in-law uh, almost under the nose of his wife. At some point, he actually looked into whether it was possible to have an Islamic marriage with both sisters, but was told that that wouldn't be allowed. We heard that Saba had become pregnant by Hafiz at some stage during their affair. She'd been forced to have an abortion, so emotions were running really high. Saba became very fixated with her relationship with Hafiz. Uh, she described it as an abusive relationship, and she had good reason to say that, because he was 10 years older than her. He was much more worldly experienced than her. There was a degree of manipulation in the relationship. Police discovered in February 2016 that Hafiz had called his relationship with Saba and told her he and Saima were planning on moving out of the family home with their children. In fact, a moving date was set for Wednesday, 25th of May, 2016. I think she had planned to kill her sister sometime before, but when she found out that her sister was moving out very soon, that was the trigger for her to do it quickly, to find an opportunity. For Saba, knowing that her brother-in-law was not only breaking off the relationship, but that he was intending to move the family elsewhere, so she was going to lose not only him, but her sister, that would have provoked rage. Because firstly, she recognizes that she means nothing. He doesn't want her anymore. She's discarded. But secondly, her sister seems to be leaving with it all. The very person that she's learned to resent, that she's been fueled with this anger and envy for, is leaving with her prize. Imagine the power in that moment, the fear, the anger, the hostility. That's where the rage begins. Saba had the motive. She had the murder weapon. She just needed an opportunity. And a last minute family funeral gave her that window. There was one day when she could be alone in the house with Sema, although the four children were asleep at the time upstairs. So she planned to take action on the day when the rest of the family would be out at the funeral. Computer records show Saba had actually Googled how long does a Muslim funeral take? Now, that was to ensure that she had enough time to both kill Saima and make the house ready for her parents to come back. Having identified her window of opportunity to murder, Saba prepared to carry out her plan. Saba came home, I think, about 9.30 in the evening. Her sister went out to... Uh, fill up the car with petrol and visit uh, an elderly client who lived no nearby. At about, well, it was just before 11 o'clock, uh, Saba sent four text messages to Sema Khan, telling her that uh, one of the children was crying um, and she should come home as soon as possible. What Saba did when her sister returned home reveals the true nature of this cold, calculating killer. And miraculously, Saima's last movements were caught on camera. One of the neighbors had a camera pointing in the direction of Saima's house. It was actually to protect his own driveway, but fortuitously for the police, it managed to pick up Saima's arrival home. 
In this CCTV footage, we see Saima Khan arrive home and enter her house. The hall lights stay on for 45 seconds, but then they go out for eight minutes. Over the next eight minutes, Saba Khan stabbed her sister multiple times. And the level of hatred and, and ferocity behind it is really exhibited in where she stabbed her. She stabbed her face and her skull and her abdomen, cut her hands. I think there were defensive wounds on her hands. The main wound was to the neck and she stabbed her so forcefully that the knife that she'd bought days before went through, through and through the neck and almost decapitated her sister. So she was bleeding out in the hallway. When we spoke to Sava about what had happened during those eight minutes, she only had a very limited recollection. She said that when her sister came home, an argument developed very rapidly between the two of them, and it started in the kitchen. All she can remember is reaching for a knife in the drawer in the kitchen, and then walking towards her sister and going for her. Some eight minutes later, she was sitting on the floor with a knife in her hand, wondering what had just happened. On the 23rd of October, 2017, Saba Khan's case came before the Old Bailey, and the unexpected happened. Saba Khan pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 22 years. I don't think anyone will ever be able to penetrate the mind of Saba Khan and find out what made her change, not just in a small way, but in such a drastic way in the way that she felt towards Saima, to cause her to bring about her death in such a brutal fashion. It's something which, with which Saba will live with for the rest of her life. Thank you for watching. Murder UK is a website dedicated to giving the facts about murders and serial killers within the UK. Please consider subscribing and press that bell icon to be notified when we update new videos. Thank you.